me great pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Bob Guzer. Bob has been a faculty member at Scripps since 1975 and is currently a senior professor and a co-director in the Integrative Oceanography Division. He's also the director for the Center of Coastal Studies. And he has received numerous awards for his coastal science research and in 1993, Bob was selected by his peers to become a member of the American Geophysical Union. And that's among the top honors for researchers in the geosciences. And the main focus of Bob's research has been on the study of ocean waves and waves, how they've driven flows in shallow water. And of course, that has a lot to do with how sand is deposited on um, our beaches and the profound role that plays in the shaping of the Southern California coastline. So this is an extremely relevant subject to all of us um, living here on the coast as well as extremely interesting scientifically. So without further ado, I would like to um, ask Bob uh, to come and give the lecture. Thank you. I'm going to be using the same uh, projector here that was used when I first came in 1975. Um, <laughs> I haven't yet converted to PowerPoint. And this is my laser printer here. Um, as Nigel said, uh, I'm going to be talking uh, t to you about wave-driven circulation in the surf zone. And the motivation for studying this, or at least one of the motivations, is when waves approach a beach at an angle, here's the beach, here's the waves, and they're coming in at an angle, and they break, they drive sand in a river along the beach. And folks know this because if you construct a jetty, sand will pile up along the jetty as it is interrupted. So we know that there is a so-called literal drift, and it does move sand. I'm not going to be talking about sand today, I thought about that I might, but I decided that I would talk to you about the circulation, the water motion that is carrying the sand along the beach. Well, with that introduction, as I just said, I'm Bob Guza, and what I like to do, and do do, is make field observations of surf zone circulation. And what you see here is the surf zone. This is the beach. That way is offshore. Out here is the abyss as far as I'm concerned. Um, we stick pipes into the beach, into the sand, and then on these crossbars that you see here, there's a current meter right there. That's the pro head, and it measures the velocity of the water as it moves past. And there's a stack of these things, or there's a row of these, extending out. And from the shoreline, this is very shallow water. You can see the beach is almost exposed. The depth might be this big. Out here, to, well, these are very large waves. These are about five meter waves. But we go offshore to maybe a couple hundred meters. So we're looking at the flows and the waves in the surf zone. And what I'm going to be telling you about is how is it that Although the waves are oscillatory, a crest comes by and then there's a trough, the water moves shoreward, but then it also moves offshore, you might think that's all going to average out to zero, so that there's no net motion. That's not true. Breaking waves drive a very strong mean circulation. Uh, mean meaning time average. You put your current meter there, you average out the waves, and you look at the current that's left, and it can be quite strong. And it's driven by the breaking waves. And I'm going to be talking first about a very simple case of circulation on a beach in which in the alongshore direction there's no variation in the depth or the waves. If you go a couple hundred meters up the beach, the waves coming in are about the same height as the ones along the beach. So there's nothing particularly changeable about the alongshore um, as you move in the alongshore direction on the beach. And then finally, I'm going to talk about what happens if you do have very complex bathymetry on a beach or the wave height changes a lot. How does that change the circulation? So that's what I'm going to tell you about today. And um, also put in a couple of things about why I think this is a fantastic job and I'm lucky to be here. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, as I said, wave-driven circulation in the surf zone, I'm going to be 
primarily talking about the mean flow that goes up a beach when you have waves coming in at an angle. Well, I'm going to talk about the mean flow, but I'm also, later in the talk, going to be telling you about how this mean flow starts to wiggle and meander, like the smoke rising off a cigarette starts to wiggle and meander. So although it's kind of steady, it also wiggles. This problem of wave-driven circulation on a beach has been studied by numerical modelers and theoreticians for quite a while. I am not going to discuss any equations at all, but just to tell you that equations do exist. When I wave my arms, there's some equations standing behind me. Sometimes the equations are waving their arms too, um, but there are computers, fluid mechanics behind the kinds of things that I'm going to be telling you about. And this means I'm particularly learned because I use a Greek symbol, eta. But I'm not even going to define what these are. I'm just going to tell you that when waves come into a beach and they break, they have a push that's associated with them in the direction that they're going. It's a so-called radiation stress. It's just a big word, but it means they have a push. And it's a mean push. It averages, its average is not zero. If waves come in at an angle, the component that's going that way exerts a push on the water column. That's the breaking force. This is a longshore current that's driven along the beach, and it drags along the bottom. The harder you push, the stronger the current is until it's just strong. If it's like pushing a block along something sticky, the, faster you, the harder you push, the faster it moves, and the, and the force that stops it is friction. So you're pushing the water along against the friction. Well, one can work out exactly what the strength of that push is. This was done in the early 1970s by a theoretician at Cambridge. And what he suggested was the mean alongshore current in the surf zone V depends on the wave energy and the wave angle. This says if you increase the wave angle and you keep the wave height the same, the current gets stronger. Well, that makes sense. And also, if you keep the angle the same and you make the waves bigger, the longshore current also gets stronger. All right, but so this is a theoretical kind of a calculation. And where I came into this was, what do you see? If you go to the beach and you put current meters out in Santa Barbara, and this was along this beach right here. Uh, we had this experiment planned for uh, maybe two years in advance. We didn't know that when we went there in February 1980 that it would be the height of an El Nino and there would be some of the largest waves they've ever seen along this stretch of coast. We were kind of right in there and it ate up the parking lot and things like that. But anyway, we put some current meters out across here and the idea was to see what those alongshore currents looked like. Clarifying that a little bit, here's the instruments that we put out. Here's the seafloor. We're moving offshore. Here's our pipes that we jam into the sand, stick them down in the sand, and mount your instruments on them. And as I said, we've got a transect. This is about four or five meters water depth, 15 or so feet. And the surf zone's in here. We're measuring the currents from these waves. Well. And we also have pressure sensors. A pressure sensor you can think of as weighing the water above it. So when a crest goes by, a wave crest, you have a high pressure. When a wave trough goes by, you have a low pressure. So you can actually, with an instrument on the bottom, measure the waves that are going up and down. That's convenient because trying to put something up that pierces through the surface that the waves actually run up and down on leads to things like this. Uh, seaweed hangs up on them, etc. So the point is, we can put our instruments on the bottom and still measure what the wave height's doing. Well, this is a plot of the wave height. This is the offshore distance. So we're moving on this plot from offshore to onshore, and the plot is the wave height. How big is the wave crest to trough? Well, what you see is the little dots are the observations from these things. Is first the waves get bigger. Then they break in the surf zone, and the wave height gets smaller. That's just what you see if you look out your window. 
And what's shown here is a model for that wave height transformation, and the model does pretty well. Well, what about the currents? This plot's a little different. This line is this line, and we're looking down now on the ocean. The vectors, the little things with the arrows, correspond to the mean currents. This is the offshore direction. Here's the beach. We didn't just have a line here. We had a couple sensors up the beach 100 meters, 80 meters away, 60 meters. As you move along the beach and you look at the length of the arrows, they're pointing kind of along shore, and they're also kind of the same length. As you move up the beach, you get the same current at the same offshore distance. Things aren't changing as you go along the beach. Here's the surf zone, and you can see that the arrows point strongly this way, so the profile of the longshore current looks kind of like that, and it's big in the surf zone. Well, here's a plot going in the cross shore direction. This is offshore. Here's the water depth, four meters. So this is the bottom contour. And here's those mean longshore currents, the dots. And here's a model. Well, this is about 50 centimeters a second, steady current. Well, I'll translate that into something that made sense to me when I'm floating around on the beach. That's a mile an hour. If you've ever been floating around in the surf zone and you're kind of unconscious and you suddenly realize half an hour later you're a half a mile away from where you started. Yes, you are, and that's why. It's because you're driving a steady flow. It's like a river in the surf zone. The waves are going back and forth on top of it, but if you average it all out, you can be a mile an hour. Now, these were little bitty waves. These were only about a meter high waves. This was a small day. On one of those larger days, when the waves were not 50 centimeters, but two or three meters, this current can be up to four miles an hour. That starts to get so strong that you stand like this, it throws up a rooster tail and you start floundering around. It's that strong. So you can make really strong currents. And they can move a lot of sand, too, which is the motivation for why some of this gets funded, because of its potential relationship to the movement of sand. OK, well, that's Santa Barbara. And that was fun, but we later went to the East Coast. And I'll explain why, because it's a different kind of beach. And I'll explain how, diff how it is different in a minute. But this is just an aerial photograph of the beach at Duck, North Carolina, on the outer banks of North Carolina. It's a long barrier island, wonderful place to spend some time. The ocean's over here, about two blocks away, there's a big bay, and it's kind of a neat place to be. And, but another reason why it's neat is because of the toys that they have there. They're not toys, they're field tools. Specialized vehicles for doing the kind of research that I do. What you see here is a coastal research amphibious buggy. This is an Army Corps of Engineers research facility, and it's out here in about 20 feet of water, it's actually driving around on the bottom. They drive it around, it's very tall, it's about 40 feet tall, and then you can, do, you can use it as a research platform. So that's a very handy thing to have. But the point that I want to make now about the beach is different. Look at the pattern of breaking waves. You can see where the waves are white, obviously they're breaking there. Well, they break. But now, there's this strip in here where they're not breaking. Well, this is just one snapshot. But suppose that you took, you opened your lens up, well, or you took a whole bunch of these and you averaged them together for 15 minutes. Pictures like this. What do you see? Well, you see that indeed, there's a strip out here where the waves break. The reason this is white is because wave after wave after wave breaks there. There's a sandbar here. And then there's a trough where it's deeper, where waves don't break. And then there's the beach. So the beach at Santa Barbara didn't have a bar. It just kind of was shallow and got deep. Here it gets it's shallow, gets deeper, gets shallower, and then gets deeper. So it had a strong sandbar. And that's why we went there. One of the reasons was to look at a beach that had a different configuration. As I mentioned, these toys are cool. This is the crab up on the beach, and these tires are about as tall as I am. And 
and just drive this thing out through the surf zone. And it's very handy for mounting instruments off there, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of cool tools. They have a Lark from the Vietnam era. It's an amphibious vehicle that you can drive it around on the beach and then it's a boat when it's offshore. So they have these things that are very handy as opposed to launching a Zodiac through the surf zone. We do that, it's, it can be very interesting. <laughs> well, what do you see if you go to somewhere like Duck, and as I showed you, we have our instruments deployed off in the cross shore direction. Well, we went there for a couple months. We like to go to these kinds of experiment sites in the late summer when the waves are small. That's so that we can deploy all our instruments in small waves. Deploying instruments in large waves in the surf zone, it just doesn't happen. Um, so we like to deploy the waves when the waves are small, then wait for fall, and then you start to get storms in the, in the autumn and you get some, well, and you get some waves that you want to study. So I'm showing you here a time series. This is the date, month of day, so this is 25 August and this is October 5. And what we're plotting up here is wave height. Each one of these little points is we got the wave height for that hour. So these are hourly values. It's the average height of the waves from crest to trough outside of the surf zone coming in toward the beach. So here's those periods of low waves and then there's these large, larger wave events. That's a meter and a half. So these are waves that maybe they're overhead or slightly overhead if you're a surfer. Well, this is that push number that I talked about, about how much a longshore push there is. It depends on the wave height and also the wave angle. So there's these bursts of periods of time. They might last, well, six hours at their maximum or something like that. These are fronts that just move through, make the waves big, make a lot of push, and here's the mean alongshore current at one current meter in the surf zone. When the waves are big and there's a lot of push, this current's up to, well, 150 centimeters a second. That's getting up there. That's three or four miles an hour. So every time a storm comes through, the currents get strong. This is just one month. We stayed there until December 4th. Well, what do we learn from that kind of an exercise? Well, here's the cross-shore profile of instruments, and they're all labeled D. Every one of the Ds is a current meter and a pressure sensor. We're measuring how strong the currents are and how big the waves are. This is time again, 40 days. This axis is how strong is the alongshore current, for example, at D6. That's right here. You see the depth is about 2 or 3 meters, so it's mm, 12 or 15 feet water depth, no, 10 feet. Um, and what you see at D7, for example, is the mean alongshore current's weak, then it jumps up, the units here is hours, drops down again, and the, and the solid line is a model, a numerical model that says, I know how strong the waves are that are coming in toward the beach, I know the slope of the beach and the bathymetry, and the model makes a prediction of how strong the alongshore current is. Well, there's pretty darn good agreement in all these gauges about how strong the current is observed and what's predicted. These are hourly averages of the current. So the conclusion here is both on a beach that doesn't have a bar, like Santa Barbara, and on a beach that does have a bar, turns out you have to f account for the bar when you're figuring out how waves break and then stop breaking and start breaking again, but you can do a pretty good prediction of how strong those mean alongshore currents are. On these relatively simple beaches that don't have any, along any strong alongshore variation in the waves or the bathymetry. One of the exciting things about being in North Carolina, I learned, is they have a lot of lightning. And I learned what happens if, from all those instruments that are offshore, that are cabled to shore through an armor well logging cable, it's a braided, twisted steel cable with an incredible braking strength that brings power from shore out to the sensors and the signals back to our computers. If you have them all bundled up on the beach in a big bundle about this thick, and then 
this happens. What happens is a surge of power goes both ways through your cable. It goes to every instrument that is attached to it, which is all of the instruments, because that's how they're getting power, and it blows up all the communications chips. It goes the other way to the computer that's at the other end of the cable, and it puts it in an electric chair and makes it hop around for a while. <laughs> we had to retrieve the entire experiment, repair the instruments, and deploy them a second time. That's why one of the reasons Duck was interesting, Duck, North Carolina. Um, around, this is a little bit of a complicated overhead, but I'll explain it to you. Around 1990 or so, approximately, numerical modelers using powerful computers started to do numerical simulations solving complex sets of equations on computers that became powerful enough to be able to solve them. And these folks, theoreticians and modelers, asked the question, here's the beach, here's the cross-shore direction, and we've just said there's an longshore current that's whipping down along the beach, driven by the waves coming in at an angle. They said, okay, I'll put the waves in my model, and It'll make a current, but what happens to the current as it evolves over time? Is it steady? It starts to wiggle. The alongshore current starts to wiggle. And if it's strong enough, it starts to wiggle a lot. This is like the smoke rising from a cigarette. It's one analogy. When it first starts to rise, it might be in a nice collimated tube. But then it starts to do wiggles. It's because it is unstable. This is a fluid mechanics term, and it means it's possible for, for a certain state to exist, but any little tweak on it changes the state, and it just moves off into something else, here shedding eddies that move offshore. This is kind of like saying, I guarantee that it is, at least in theory, possible for me to balance a bowling ball on the end of this rod. But I also guarantee that if I manage to get it there, that any slight tip on it is going to make the ball fall off and it's no longer going to be a bowling ball sitting on the stick, but something else. The alongshore currents and their configuration of a steady alongshore current that doesn't wiggle is like the bowling ball on the stick. Any tweak and it starts wiggling and throwing off eddies. Well, this is a computer simulation. And I will say that there are several different strengths of instabilities. Here, the instability is such that the longshore current just kind of wiggles a little bit. Here, it's throwing off eddies, et cetera. The point is, a numerical model, you can make it do anything by turning some knobs about the details of the mechanics. So what the theory really suggested is it's possible that you don't have a steady longshore current one that just moves along, but one that is whirling off eddies, et cetera, et cetera. Well, which do you have in the ocean? That's the question. Well, motivated by these kinds of computer simulations, we went back to Duck in 1997, and instead of putting out just one cross-shore transect, here's the shoreline, here we are offshore, what we had before was one line that just went off shore like that. And we looked at the, how the waves got small along the line and the currents were maximum here. But now, at any one depth, here's a three meter contour, we've got a bunch of sensors in a line, an array. We were looking for things like, can we see eddies, whirling eddies, propagating through the array? Not just a steady flow, but localized blobs that correspond to those instabilities. So there's, that's, that's the question that we had. So we're looking for a longshore propagation of features moving through the array. Do they exist as was suggested by those uh, computer models? The answer is, in a nutshell, they sure do. Um, I certainly don't want to get into the details of the analysis behind this, but here's those dots that I showed you before. Each solid dot is one of our current meters. 
using a sophisticated signal processing technique designed to look for patterns that propagate through the array. What came out on this particular day is a big circular gyre like this that is propagating along with the direction of the mean along shore current. So indeed, it's not just a steady thing, but it's got these whirling eddies that are whirling around and themselves moving along. So this sort of thing confirmed that, well, that the circulation is really complex. It's not just there's waves, and maybe they have a 10 second period, so there's a fluctuation at 10 seconds, and then the mean current. That's all. That would be the nice, simple picture. What there actually is is the waves plus a mean current that's not stable and is throwing off all kinds of complicated eddy features like you'd expect if you turned on a fire hose and squirted a jet out into still water. It's not going to come out as a nice, smooth jet and just kind of decay. It's going to be all over the place. That's what the surf zone circulation looks like. Well, you might think, well, uh, okay, well, who cares about that? I do. Uh, but, <laughs> because this stuff is just so cool, but um, that doesn't necessarily sell well. Um, well, suppose, now, this is a numerical model again. This is the offshore direction. This is the beach, then here, and here we are in the alongshore direction moving down the beach. You are looking at a numerical model simulation of what happens if you inject dye at this point. Imagine that there's a pipe coming out into the surf zone and out of that exit point is coming dye. You might also imagine it's brown dye, but we won't get into that. It's red dye in this case. And what you're looking at is the longshore current is moving in this direction from top to bottom, and it's a steady current. And it's just bringing the dye in a plume down here. And of course, the dye does spread out a little bit because the model has in it the stirring by the waves. But the dye doesn't really get out beyond the surf zone because there's no wave breaking out here. The flow is just a steady flow that just carries it along the beach. Well, this is what you get if you just have waves plus a steady current. What if you have waves plus the steady current plus the instabilities that make the current wander? Now you get this. It's the same idea. The dye, this is the cross shore location. Here's the beach. The dye is injected here. The mean current carries it this way. But because of all the instabilities, there's billows that move way offshore. The surf zone's only this wide. This is one kind of case. This is another kind. Of, this is another simulation. You contrast this to the previous shot where it was just this nice steady thing and the dye doesn't get outside the surf zone. You care about things like this because the question is what happens to pollution that comes directly onto the beach out of this pipe? Does it just, is it constrained to the surf zone where it's very thick and concentrated? Or does it get dispersed by blowing these eddies and roll-ups offshore the surf zone? So, what seems to be kind of maybe a technical distinction, is it steady or not, matters if you want to know what happens to pollution in the surf zone. Okay, well, suppose, okay, well, here's two hypotheses. The hypothesis one is uh, the die looks like this. Hypothesis two is no, the die looks like this. Numerical models. I like them because they allow justification for doing experiments like let's build a device that we can drive around in the surf zone and sample dye concentrations. The dye can either be dye that we put in ourselves, EPA approved dye, I'll add, or it can be a natural dye uh, like cootie concentrations of, of, of uh, bacteria. The point is how can you sample in the surf zone? and tell what the dye concentration is. Well, here's an idea. A jet ski. On the jet ski is GPS, Global Positioning System. 
You all know what that is, I think. You have the little handheld ones, or maybe you have it in your car. It tells you very accurately where you are when you're driving around in the surf zone. Um, this, incidentally, is not the GPS that is a $200 handheld GPS or, or whatever is in your car. This is a semi-macho GPS that, well, this is a, it's a $20,000 GPS, not a $200 GPS, but it's not a $2 million GPS either. The point is, we know where this vessel is with accuracy about that much in the horizontal and that much in the vertical as it's driving around, going over waves. We, so we have to keep track of it we, frequently so that we can tell if it's up in waves or not. Right now we have one of these. It pings to the bottom. We use it to survey the bathymetry. Where are the sandbars? Take away the sonic depth finder, get rid of this in the figure, and put an intake here for dye and the fluorometer up on the jet ski, and we're going to, we hope, we're going to drive around and sample what is the dye concentration, which of those patterns does it look like. Well, so this is one of the tools that we're working on to do that. Now, where we are so far, though, is at least on these beaches that are relatively simple in the longshore, they don't have a lot of variation in the wave height is, we can predict the mean currents pretty well. We're even doing a credible job, I think, on predicting the instabilities. Okay. What happens now when you go away from, oh, these are almost pathologically simple beaches. They were selected because they don't have any curvature. They don't have any irregularities in the bathymetry. We, we tried to find underwater pool tables because it was suitable for the models. Well, as you look out there, or you look out here, either one, same thing, this is the Beach and Tennis Club. This is the Scripps Pier. And these are just visual, this is just a snapshot, and it has an artist's interpretation of what the waves look like in their height. But you know that this is true. The waves at the Beach and Tennis Club are very small, always. That's why all the kayakers launch out of the Beach and Tennis Club. Well, if you get a little bit further up, here, south of the pier, you can just see how much wider the surf zone is than here. Up here, this is where that really cool house is, up at Black's, where it looks like a mushroom on the beach. It's another place with really tiny waves there all the time. And then finally, humongous, yes, this is Black's. Okay, Black's is a world famous surf spot because the waves are so big relative to anywhere else around them. So here is wave height variation like crazy. The waves right here can be 15 feet, and a few hundred meters up the beach be three feet. There's huge variations in the wave height. Well, why? What's the cause of that? Here's the same picture. Here's the Scripps Pier. Here's the Beach and Tennis Club. It's this, here's the shoreline. We are up here somewhere in the aquarium. It's because of the Scripps Canyon complex that is underwater. You can't see it, of course, because well, you, know, you can't see through the water. But the seafloor is about as far from a pool table out there as it can get. I want to impress upon you how this is a large feature. Here we are on the 10 meter contour. Here's the 15 meter contour. This is 40 feet of water depth. If you just kind of move along here, you're 40, well, 15 meters, 15 meters, all of a sudden, you're 100 meters. 100 meters. I mean, that's so, it, so there's a drop off of 80 meters in water depth from 20 meters to 100 meters in a relatively short, along short distance. The sides of the canyons are like 45 degrees, they're vertical in places, and they are large. 80 meters is 240 feet. We're talking about you can stack houses, many houses on top of each other in these canyons. When waves propagate over this kind of bathymetry, it alters them, it can create focus locations where energy is concentrated owing to propagation over here, that's blacks. And if the energy is concentrated somewhere, it obviously is unconcentrated somewhere else. It's 
these canyons cause those patterns of highs and lows that, well, that you can see by looking out the window. Numerical models. Suppose that on this bathymetry, you assume you have a wave field coming in and offshore, it's uniform. It doesn't have any variation because it's just coming from a distant storm, but then it propagates over these canyons. This is a prediction of what the wave energy looks like as you move along a shallow contour, here the eight meter contour, and this is wave energy. And it's normalized by the offshore energy. This is blacks. The energy at blacks is up to two or three times what it is offshore because it's a focus point. Here's that mushroom house thing, and there the energy is like 10% of the offshore energy. There is this huge alongshore variation in wave energy that is modeled. Well, the wave direction is also affected by propagation over this extreme bathymetry, and the wave angle is predicted to turn around and twist around as well. Now, well, what does this have to do with the circulation? This is what I'm leading to. How is the circulation in this kind of a situation different than the circulation where the wave energy would just be completely uniform in the alongshore direction? How are they different? In the case where it's a straight uniform beach, the currents are driven by waves that come in at angles. If they come straight in, there is no alongshore drift. It just is in response to the angles. In this kind of a situation, you don't have to have any obliquity approach. The waves can come straight into the beach everywhere and still drive along shore currents. Well, how can they do that? Because they're not coming in at angles. There's something that's known as wave setup, which is when waves come ashore and break, they actually, they're coming this way, they actually make the mean surface tip up. The mean surface, if you average it out, it's called wave setup. And it can be as much as 20% of the wave height. What I'm saying is, there's no waves, the surface is flat, of course, gravity makes it flat. When waves come in and break, this is the surf zone surface, it actually tips up. And the amount that it tips up, the super elevation at the shoreline, is approximately 20% of the wave height. So if the waves are two meters, the mean level is actually set up 40 centimeters. It's, the surface isn't flat, the waves, the water level is actually that much further shoreward for a 40 centimeter elevation rise. Actually, this matters. If you have 10 meter waves and you have two meters of vertical elevation at the shoreline and your house is one meter above mean sea level, you really care about wave setup because it brings the El Nino waves through the window of the uh, the, uh, the beach and tennis club it was wave set up. The surface was actually high. What does this have to do with circulation on this beach? At these locations, the setup is high. At these locations, the setup is low. Well, think about what the surface looks like looking along the beach. It's actually pointing downhill from where it's set up to where it's not. In the numerical models, the current flows downhill. So you drive currents from the region of high waves to the region of low waves. It doesn't have to do with the wave angle, it has to do with how the wave height changes along shore. That's what's shown here. We're moving along shore. This is mean sea level at the shoreline. How much is it super elevated at the waterline above the flat surface? Here at Scripps Canyon, it's 20 centimeters, and down here, well, it's basically zero. Here's the currents that are driven by that in a model. Two meters a second is driven. That's so strong, you will not stand up in that current. This is a model, though. Well, and it's predicted that the current flows, what you see is this peak, is right here. And so it says you get really strong currents where the wave height gradient along shore is strong. Numerical models again. You want a different sign? Give me a couple hours with the model. But once again, they have their utility. Let's put out a whole bunch of sensors on shore. Here's the pier. 
This is a so-called NSEX experiment, Near Shore Canyon experiment. It's scheduled to happen this fall, right down, well, right down here. We're going to put current meters and pressure sensors out all along the shoreline in the surf zone to find out whether or not there really is a two meter a second current that goes from where the waves are small to where the waves are big. Is it really there? Well, this is the part of the study that I'm in. It's about the surf zone. I'll add that I have colleagues at the Naval Postgraduate School, Woods Hole, etc. Every number is a current meter and a pressure sensor. The stuff I showed you before is all in here. That's not even included. They are measuring the transformation of waves across the canyon with gauges out in, in between the canyon heads. I'm doing a little surf zone experiment here. There's a much larger study going on of how the waves affect how the waves are affected by the canyons, not in the surf zone, but over the canyons themselves. So this is the um, NSEX experiment. Now, I love new toys. You put a current meter somewhere, and well, it tells you what the currents are at that place. And maybe from enough of those observations, you can back out the answer to the question, where does a water particle go? Well, you're not following a water particle, you're sitting there. Well, of course, people have built drifters for a long time. This is a surf zone drifter. A drifter is something, you throw it out in the ocean, it follows the water, and you somehow know where your drifter is, and so you've got a history of where would a water particle go. A standard shelf drifter uh, wouldn't last long in the surf zone because it's too flimsy. I mean, we're talking about an instrument you can put in the surf zone, have big waves break on it, and it doesn't care. It just keeps following the water. Well, GPS again, Global Positioning System, it's got a receiver. This is 50 centimeters. It's a case this big, this tall. It's got an antenna that sticks up, and as it drifts around, it reports back to shore where it is. And so, Using a surf zone drifter like this, you don't get a map of the currents at a place, but rather from each drifter where it goes over time. Now remember, we talked about if the steady model was right, the simple model, you put it in and it would just move along shore. The waves on this day were coming in this direction. Here's the break point. Here's the beach. This is a long shore. We let our drifter go. It started going in that direction. Whoa! It did this. Wow! It did that. And this one did this. This one went this way, went around in seven revolutions, and then jetted offshore. This is support for the complicated flow model, not the simple model. We want to put these kinds of drifters in conjunction with fixed instruments and the surveying jet ski with die to try and get a much better handle in the future of not just what's the current at a location, but where the particles move, what happens on complex bathymetry. So that's where we're headed in the future. In summary, alongshore currents on simple bathymetry, no alongshore variations are more complicated than believed in the 80s, but uh, we think the important physical processes, and I told you about one, the so-called shear waves, the meanders, are pretty well understood, and we can parameterize them in models, so we do get good predictions of what the alongshore currents look like. We're ready to observe and model circulation on much more complex bathymetry, and that's the NSEX experiment. And also, in closing, I'd like to make clear I've described the work of a lot of people. Theoreticians who did, Bowen, Long and Higgins, who did some of the early fluids work in the 70s, uh, developing these models. Um, I did not put those current meters on pipes out in the surf zone physically. Well, I was there, but I was probably more in the way than anything else. <laughs> There's a bunch of people who do know how to deploy instruments in the surf zone, engineers and technicians, um, colleagues who are actually involved in the experiment from Woods Hole and elsewhere, uh, Europeans have been involved, students. This is not by any means a one-man show. It's a multi-person, multi-nation show to try and sort out these complicated surf zone flows. Thanks.
there's lots of hypotheses for why there are sandbars, but even, I mean, I think a really fair question is, why is there such a strong sandbar on that beach and only usually very weak sandbars on this beach? The mechanisms of sandbar formation are poorly understood. They really are. We do get sandbars on our beaches in winter when storm waves erode our beaches, the part you can see up on the beach face, that sand just moves offshore, it doesn't move offshore real far in, into a sandbar-like deposit. So we do have them here, but it's a very pronounced sandbar on the east coast on that stretch of beach. The reasons are not known. Yeah. Yes. Although sandbars can be long straight features, like the time-lapse image I showed you, it was clear that sandbar, just to, and aerial photos show this as well, it can extend for miles along the beach as a straight continuous feature at times. We don't seem to get that here. We get more localized. Every little hole isn't necessarily a sandbar, but I wouldn't say a sandbar is precisely defined. But we don't usually have that really long straight bars that they have on the East Coast, but... And really long, you miles. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's partially because our coast is so twisty and so irregular that there's not miles of beach where everything is not changing, at least not around here. So maybe there's a short sandbar in La Jolla Shores, but then the wave field is so much different further up the coast that it's a completely different kind of environment. So we don't tend to get those long, continuous bar features. Those, the question is, what are the holes that you step in? that when you're walking out into the water and the holes might be kind of like this big or something like that, those actually have a name and the name is mega ripples. Uh, ripples, you know what they are, they're the little sort of features that might be this big that you see the waves make you look at the bottom sometimes in nice patterns. Well, mega meaning these are those things on steroids and they tend to exist as isolated features. Um, there's numerical models that predict why they form and it has to do with positive feedback where if there's a stone or some kind of a small hole that it affects the wave and circulation and the hole grows. I personally don't know, um, I don't know what the validity of that theory is. There was a study done recently here at Scripps by Bradley Werner and one of his students of those holes. When do they occur and when do they not occur? Um, they didn't really pin down the formation mechanism about why in detail they form, but they do appear to form most often when there's not a lot of tidal variation. They'll, they'll be there more at neap tide than spring tide. It takes a while for them to form, and when the tide level is changing, apparently the conditions change too rapidly for them to become well formed. I haven't answered your question, um, but that I think is what's known about those sorts of features, the small holes. Uh, that's a very fair question. Um, at Duck, North Carolina, this is a U.S. government reservation, and it's private, well, I mean, it is owned by the government, um, by the federal government for purposes of doing that kind of research. And it's closed. It's a, it's a closed speech. This is not a closed speech. One of the reasons we have no, surf, no instruments in the surf zone south of the pier is because there's too many people. We have no instruments in the so-called Black's Bowl. Black's Bowl contains the various breaks. If you're a surfer, you know what they are. And we've worked out with Sergeant Sundemeyer, uh, the, the uh, lifeguard sergeant, what is the area that is heavily surfed? This is the area where we have no sensors in the surf zone. We have them along the 10 meter contour, 30 feet of water where they're not gonna interfere with surfers. But there's a 500 meter region where all we have is one pressure sensor and it's buried in the sand. So unfortunately, we won't be able to be in the surf zone in the region where the waves are largest 
because because it's because it's a surf spot and the people who surf that spot are very devoted to it and I would not consider no I'm serious I would not consider infringing on what those people get out of that area no I'm serious I mean there are there are people who are there every day, they climb up and down those cliffs, and this is a very important part of their life, and if I were them, and I showed up with a bunch of current meters in their break, I'd be pissed. Um, so, no, we're not putting them in that location. We're squeezing, based on the suggestions of the sergeant, uh, just, how, just how close we can get to their break, but breaks. The focus point moves at Blacks. It depends on whether it's a south swell or a north swell or a west swell, and there's lots of different break names. We're not in that area. Uh, we have deployed instruments many times just north of the Scripps Pier. And in fact, that's the break that's known as north of the pier, oddly enough. And uh, we've actually had good luck surviving with surfers. Um, we usually put up marker poles, and we've put up marker poles like one of those tripod things on each end of the thing, and what surfers do is shoot the, shoot the gap on top. Um, but the point is they haven't hit anything, and uh, we do seem, and our drifters, the surfers seem to be able to coexist with the drifters, they don't care. They sit on the board, they watch a drifter go by, and they just don't care. So the drifters aren't the problem, it's the, it's the fixed instruments, but we do have to be conscious of that. I have not. Um, one of the reasons for doing these kinds of studies about waves over very abrupt bathymetry, crazy bathymetry, is to validate models. It's not, the question is not, what exactly is the wave field onshore of, the, of those canyons? I mean, that is an interesting question, but the, that the larger question is, can we make models that will predict what happens to that wave field over that extreme bathymetry? If the answer to that is yes, then we can start to do things like, suppose there's a big hole dredged out there. What's it going to do to the waves? There are apocryphal stories of sand mining and things in Britain, I believe, that have caused catastrophic problems, supposedly, on shore where the bathymetry was changed offshore and it created new focus patterns onshore that then caused massive erosion. But none of those studies have actually been done. So anyway, we're trying to develop models that can be used to answer that kind of applied question. <laughs>